Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, a podcast where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelinek. This week, is it time for a weather adventure? I don't know. Before we get there, hope your weather's doing well. Hope it's treating you properly. 24 hours I've gone from kind of the mid-80s Fahrenheit, uh, 30 or so C, to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees C or so. A little rain outside, so I have opened the window. So if you get some background noise, I just heard a car honk. You know, I know some people like record a lot of times with that ambient background noise. And, I, you know, I could see it working. I tend not to do it as much on just audio stuff because I don't want to... Maybe it's because I'm afraid I'll lose my train of thought or there'll be a sudden loud noise that I can't prepare for. I think on video it works a little better because you can kind of get a sense of what's going on in the background. In any case, if you heard hear some background noise, that's probably what's going on. It's pollen season here as well. That was the other thing I noticed. I have a Peloton bike that I do when I'm not outdoor riding or when I'm focused on more training stuff. And it sits near a window. And that window is, it's large. The apartment I'm in has, you know, taller ceilings. And so it's kind of a, a little bit like a bay window. It's a little outcropping, if you will, where the, the bike sits. And there's these ledges where I set stuff. Yeah, and sometimes I set, it, it doesn't matter, some food if I'm doing a longer ride or extra drinks or something. But also occasionally I'll set my phone there. Or, you know, if I'm watching something on the TV, the remote might sit there. Now, I know a lot of people that have you know indoor training bikes and they have all these things to hold stuff. I, I haven't gone that route. I understand why they exist. The more things I find myself wanting. In any case, went to set my phone kind of on it the other day and was like, ooh, this is dirty. And it's like, I don't think it's been that long since I cleaned it. Now, it may have been a while since I cleaned it, but it was more the fact that it's that time of year. We tend to open the windows and, and let the cool air in at night save a little bit on the air conditioning, but this time of year for us, it's definitely pollen season. So I've been busy cleaning up that sort of thing. So, you know, late spring, a lot of temperature swings, as I just alluded to, getting a little rain, which is nice, getting some of that pollen out of the air. Any case, as I said, I hope your weather's doing well wherever you are, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, right there in the tropics, doesn't matter. May it be bringing you some adventures, maybe. So let's talk about that a little bit. Now, last week, I mentioned this ultramarathon in China where there was a very unfortunate situation that arose. And I've, I've read a little bit more about it this week. You know, one of the challenges always when you're getting stuff translated from a native language, you're going to miss some of the story or you're not going to get as much of the story quite often unless it's something that's, you know, so big in the news that everybody's covering it, but what you find most of the time, it's like a story like this. It's been reported by, in this case, the Associated Press, or maybe a couple other agencies did their own story and then just reprinted a bunch of times. So you kind of, you, you see a bunch of headlines when you do a search, but in the end, it's more or less two or three stories. So read through them, got a little help from some native Chinese speaking to dig into it a little more. And I'm a little thrown off by the whole idea. And it made me start to think about the podcast. There's another thing that is coming up this coming week. It's the new episode of Alone. And for those who've never watched it, it's a bunch of people thrown in the wilderness by themselves. And it's a contest about who can outlast everybody else. Two different extremes there, right? But definitely extremes. One case, it's a bunch of athletes, and I did see a little video clip. So there was some video footage of them starting the race. Now, this race, call it an ultra marathon. Ultra marathons, I, I don't know them fully, but my general premise is unlike a regular marathon, which is a set distance, ultra marathons can vary a little bit in how long they are. This one seemed to be in that 100K or you know, a little over 60 mile range. At least that's my impression from the stories I read. So, yeah, that's, that's a lot of effort. But on top of that, it was going to be, like I think, about 2,000 meters or about 6,600 feet in elevation. And that's a lot on foot. 
I've been watching the Giro Italia and, you know, same thing. I mean, they, they do these massive amounts of climbs and do it in a day. And they do a lot more than, you know, these runners. But that, that's a lot of elevation, particularly given the distance. And the stories, I mean, what was interesting about watching these people leave the start line is I, you know, I saw a lot of them. And only one or two of them had anything on that was more than shorts and a short sleeve shirt. Now, a lot of them had like water packs, like water vests and whatnot. And there was some clips of like little stations where people could refill their water bottles. And I even saw a map of, you know, where there were going to be these replenishing stations and whatnot. But the story basically says there was no warning. There was no weather warning. And, and you guys have heard me talk about this here in the U.S. before. Whenever I hear these stories, I'm, I'm often a little skeptical because usually there was some sort of warning. It's just people weren't paying attention. Now, there are cases where it happens. And in reading one of the stories in English, I came across that the official kind of emergency agency, not, not necessarily the weather agency, but the emergency agency had for a couple of days said, listen, because this is a terrain that, you know, of course, there's, there's lower levels down near where the rivers are maybe, and then it goes up into the mountains and comes back down, that there was concerns particularly of high winds, right, but also of potential severe weather. And anytime you put high winds and severe weather together, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, summer or winter, that can lead to some icy things falling out of the sky, right? When you've got kind of that much turbulence potentially going on. Now, it could be that wherever the people got their general weather forecast from, it wasn't covered, or maybe that was just the report from the day before, right? That didn't didn't mention it in the forecast per se, but quite often forecasts are not covering, you know, these outside areas. And so I don't know for sure, right? Dug a little bit deeper. Like I said, I, I have a native speaker that can help me with some of those things, but, you know, digging back and finding whether there were official alerts or not, I, it kind of, it's unclear. But what I do know and what was clear is organizers were not prepared. Organizers were not prepared for something that could go afoul. And it didn't seem to me like the people competing were prepared for it. Now, you may say, well, that's the organ organizer's job to tell them. But I could also argue that if you're going out there doing these things and you're going up that much elevation and it's this time of year and it's in a climate that can have hazardous weather this time of year and cold temperatures and high winds well you need to be prepared for it any case 21 people died right they called the race off but you know it's too late i mean most some people abandoned early i you know, read a little bit about people that said no i recognize quickly this could be a problem and it doesn't seem like most people died from getting hit by hail or anything most people just got hypothermia and when you're running in shorts and a t-shirt and you're relatively fit, so not a lot of body fat, you know, one of the things that body fat can do for you is help insulate to some degree. These people don't have a lot of that, so there's probably a risk. If there's high winds, you also have the potential of getting dehydrated easier, not recognizing that you're dehydrating. So all that adds up, right? Now, let's take the counter to that. And let's talk about this contest alone, right? So here's a television show. These people know what they're getting into. They go out there and time and time again, uh, you know, I've watched the show. I enjoy the show. It's a little bit predictable in terms of it, but there's a, enough difference every year. And they've moved the ro locations around a little bit every year. You know, they've, they've had some they've gone back to that keeps it interesting. And, you know, undoubtedly, one or two people always do something stupid that makes for good TV, but it, it, you know, you feel bad for them. But I'm always a little surprised how much people are caught off by the weather. Now, it could just be editing, right? And, and my speculation is there's a lot of that. But I would hope that if these people are going out to these places, now my impression from reading a little bit about alone as they know kind of where they're going, at least some point in advance. Maybe not a lot of time. Maybe it's, you know, just a couple of weeks. But in my mind, the first thing I go to is, you know, some very basic things. Of course, you're going to look at, you know, what's available to hunt, to eat, to fish, whatever it is. 
what natural berries or other things might grow in the region that you want to keep an eye out for. But I'm also going to be looking at the weather. And my mind, of course, isn't going to go, what's the weather like? It's what are the extreme potentials both on both ends of the spectrum? Because that's more of what I've got to plan for. They have a list of things they can take, certain clothing, certain equipment. And then they have these other things that they could take, right? And they can't really take any technology. And I understand that part of it. So it's not like they can put a little, some sort of micro, like my watch, for instance, that has the ability to measure temperature and pressure, those sort of things. Be nice things to have. And I started thinking to myself, how would I go about, you know, handling, uh, other than doing that research, is there anything I could do if I'm on the show to better prepare myself for the weather? Because I'm thinking to myself, you know, these people have times when they have to go out to, they've, they've certainly got to fish and hunt or whatever they do to get the, the food they need to try to get through the harsher part of the season. Because it always starts kind of end of summer, goes into the fall, then it goes into winter time, right? And so with all of that, you know, I start thinking, okay, what, what might I do? And start getting creative. And, you know, there, there are ways to build kind of rudimentary weather instruments that can tell both atmospheric pressure and temperature to some I, level that you could utilize. But then I started questioning, you know, what what's the most important thing? Or, or are there things in nature? And there are things in nature. And we've talked about some of the things before, how you can tell when high pressure's at its strongest. And we talked about when they imploded the Atlanta Dome and, you know, the pressure keeping, uh, disperse, causing a dispersion problem right with stuff going where they hadn't anticipated it necessarily and you can do the same thing with smoke coming out of a fire because all these people are going to have fires going to keep warm and to cook food and there's ways that you could judge the smoke and actually even probably get a, a sense of the level of humidity based on that if you're kind of used to doing it although maybe not a good use of time and i had to thinking to myself well would it be possible in all my layers of clothes to hide like a, a thin layer of leggings, right? Something almost like stockings to where I could create a windsock. And I think that's ideally what I would look to do. Of course, I would try to hide it is not one of my items because you could put it up in a tree, you know, clear off enough of a tree to where it is hanging. Ideally, you want it out in the open, but, you know, maybe out on a, on a side limb somewhere and visible from different places you might go. Maybe if you have a, a water location, but that's not where your little shelter is or whatever to gauge not only the strength of the wind, but changes in the wind. Because I think, you know, taking temperature aside, because you're going to feel a little bit of that just in, in what you're doing, but it may not be measurable in the sense that you may take clothes on and off, depending on how hot you are and how much you're exerting. But any sort of impromptu thermometer or barometer, you're going to have to get to. And, and a windsock is something you could probably have at a distance and be able to reference it from different points. I don't know. Is this something I thought, well, that, that might be something I would do because I do think it would be wise to be able to tell when there's going to be a sudden change in behavior, not, you know, particularly one of those extremes, because if I know that it seems like the wind is changing direction, I'm getting a shift. And maybe I did know I've gone from high pressure situation to a lot more clouds or whatever it might be. But sometimes they pick locations that aren't going to give you that all the time. But the wind pattern changes should help with, with those sort of things about when a big storm might be coming in. Because even if you're on the coast or some of these other areas, it's those wind shifts sometimes that are the best indicator as to weather changes, right, without getting it some instrumentation. Now, if you're really used to an area, you might have these kind of what I would call natural barometer type settings, see changes in um, bird behavior, things like that. But you bring all that together, and if I know that the winds are changing and it's changing to a direction that I know is more likely to bring storms in that location, because that's something I would have looked into, then I may go, okay, what's what are the inside things I need to do tomorrow? Because I'm going to hang out inside, or I'm going to be not too far from my shelter because I know the weather could turn on me quickly. You know, I don't want to get caught out with a sudden drop in temperatures or you know snow coming in and, and catching me out in the cold sort of thing, because you waste a lot of energy recovering from that. And that's something you don't have a lot of spare of in these things. So
those are the things that you could do. Hopefully, you know, those people doing ultra marathons, at least they're thinking about weather. But it got me thinking, and, and there are articles written about this kind of stuff, that as adventure sports, and, you know, the ultra marathon being one of them, but not just that, like, you know, skiing in places that could have avalanches or, or other things. But all these things where we're trying to go to more extremes and doing more fantastic adventures. And I'll put a link in the show notes to a couple articles. One was about you know, the rise in this level of tourism. But recently, now that people are traveling again, the International Journal of Biometeorology did a travel edition. And while the you'll only be able to read the abstract, they, there was somebody that even did a thing about creating an, a specific index about preparing for that type of travel. You know, when you go from one area where you are and the climate conditions are a certain way, how do you acclimate if it's going to be at a higher elevation or a drier climate? And what can you do to prepare for that? So there are steps you can take. And there is some common sense you can use to go about that process. And quite frankly, this isn't just, I mean, adventure tourism now includes even things like weather chasing right? People plan their whole vacations every year about going and chasing tornadoes or storms. And, you know, it's like an adventure sport. And I understand the idea of doing it. Now, the problem I always have with storm chasing, still a thing that's kind of on my bucket list is you got to be open to a, a bigger time window. And usually it's a couple weeks because you don't always know exactly when the storms are going to hit or what's going to go on. And you may have to drive long distances and stuff. So you got to be prepared, I think, with any kind of adventure vacation that it may not live up to exactly what you anticipate. So what are you going to do to make sure it's fun no matter what, right? But if weather is playing a role in your adventure, whether it's storm chasing, and even particularly if it's storm chasing or doing something like ultra sports or anything where you're going to be out and about in places and this can be even something like going to Machu Picchu and what's the weather going to be like because you're certainly at a higher elevation and how your body adjusts to that could be very different. I remember I, I had a vacation right around a, a, a work conference and it was a work conference near Yellowstone Park. Okay. And both my boss and I at the time were going to this convention. So we split it up. I went the week beforehand. And they were going to stay the week after. We were both, I, you know, my wife and I were doing the Yellowstone thing. Her and her husband were doing uh, kind of the rafting thing in the Grand Tetons. But all of us were kind of kind of be around the same area. It was a beautiful experience. I'd never been to Yellowstone at the time. But extremely different weather. We had snow last week of May, right? Essentially the week that I'm in right now when I'm recording this, snow in Yellowstone. They were the first week of June, and they had hot, sunny days and perfect weather for whitewater rafting. Worked out for both of us. Now, the snow we weren't exactly prepared for. We had to buy. We ended up buying some sweatshirts where we were there. It wasn't cold the whole time. But it's just a reminder that understanding when you're doing things, again, at either elevations or in climates you're not used to, or where you might be in a situation, particularly with the potential for change or extreme weather, how are you going to handle it? So this is just my quick advice. As we get in travel season, is I know everybody's itching to travel again as we continue to see drop in COVID cases and people are getting vaccinated. Everybody's taking trips, and I get that. And while you may be thinking, and this is the challenge, people are you know thinking, okay, how do I do this and maybe not see as many people, or how do I still limit my COVID exposure? But don't lose sight of the fact that you ought to be paying attention to the weather. Now, you know, beach vacation, maybe not as big a deal. Or if you're going to be somewhere where you're in a car or uh, you know, inside for part of the time or can get to shelter quickly, maybe not as big of a deal. But I still recommend the following. Know your destination. And know not what the weather norms are. Yeah, you need to know that for packing, but if... There's a positive and negative. That Yellowstone example is a classic example of that. Within a week, w went from freezing temperatures and snow to short sleeve weather and whitewater rafting, right? So just know what's on the extremes. 
If you're doing something like an ultra marathon or some event or, or anything or storm chasing, know the organization. Do try to find someone's credible and ask them the question, what do you do with severe weather? You kind of want to hear that they've got some experience in it, right? Know the official forecast, not your app, not you know, what you might see on TV. I'm not saying don't use that information, but I also recommend going to the people who are tasked with saving lives in the case of severe weather. So find that because a lot of times those people write summaries as well. Take the time to read those summaries and look for the low risk, right? Or excuse me, the low potential, but high risk scenarios that they might suggest could happen, right? Just be aware of them. If you're going for a period of time, or if you have a chance, even if you're looking at an app, look for trends, right? Any shift in the trends of what's going to happen. Maybe you start looking at the weather a week in advance. And as you get closer, if something, if a forecast tends to hold true, it's a good chance it's going to happen. If it's been fluctuating a lot, you know, be wary of that. But also pay attention to the extremes. You know, what what are the extremes in a short period of time over a few days? Even if you're only going to be there a day or two, look up a few days either side and look what it's going to do. If you haven't had the chance to really look at, you know, the history of where you're going. And lastly, just have a plan. If so, severe weather comes your way and it wasn't what you were looking for, if you're not storm chasing, what are you going to do? And it's not just what are you going to do to avoid it? What are you going to do so you're not disappointed? And this to me is... You know, these people that were doing this ultra marathon, it seemed like some of them were so caught up in the moment of, I got to do this marathon, that they didn't use the common sense that said, this is stupid, which I shouldn't be going on. Some of them did, and it probably saved their lives. But when 21 people die, you got to ask yourself, you know, I agree that the organizers need to be held accountable, but you as the participant, you need to use some common sense. And you're not always going to have the chance, and that's why you want to lean on the organizers or maybe look at what other participants are doing. But know that the other participants are potentially competitors, right? So be the voice of reason in your own head. Know what makes sense. And if you're going to end up in a situation that you can't easily get out of, yeah, I'm going to tell you, don't risk it. Now, I know you're out there on an adventure But make the adventure about the fun and know what you can do as an alternative to that fun to still have a good time. All right. That's my advice. Right. Just things that I would do in a similar situation, I guess. Well, summer's upon us here in the Northern Hemisphere. Winter in the the Southern Hemisphere, meteorological version of either of those is about uh, just a couple days away here from when I'm recording. And all I can say is we hit into these core seasons these apex seasons, enjoy them. Enjoy what you get out of them at their best for you. May they be an opportunity, again, as we're coming out of uh, some of the worst we've seen with COVID and, and stretching our legs again and flapping our wings. I hope it provides you an opportunity, and I hope the weather cooperates. And I hope the weather cooperates not just in providing you great opportunities, but giving you a chance to maybe work it into whatever your adventures could be and serve as a reminder in those adventures that there's much more to the weather than the weather itself. <laughs>